Well, friends, welcome to our service here at Walton as we worship the one true God. We gather here this morning because the gospel is true. The good news that Jesus Christ has entered our world. He took upon himself our sin and our shame so that we can be liberated from the power and consequences of our sin. I don't know what you thought of the lyrics that we've just sung, but for me, it's about marveling at the gospel. If we were to have planned our way of salvation as human beings, we would not have had a gospel like that. We would have had ourselves at the center. We would have had ourselves as men and women doing our thing to make ourselves right with God. But that was never possible. The gospel of God, who would have devised this way of salvation? Look at what we've just sang. God who created the heavens and the earth, he slept beneath the stars. He was tempted in a desert that he created. God himself left his throne of glory and walked this earth. God who created and sustains all things himself washed the feet of his disciples. He fed us with truth. He fed us with bread. He shared his life with the lowest of society. And then he loved and poured himself out in front of those who condemned him to death. Would that have been the gospel that we would have chosen? The answer is absolutely not. And we thank God it isn't. We thank God it is his gospel. And it is because of that gospel that we come and we worship Jesus Christ this morning. So let's begin by bowing our heads and giving thanks to our amazing God. Let's bow our heads. Father, as the apostle says, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments, how inscrutable are your ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has ever been your counsellor? Father, we thank you as we gather for your grace and for your mercy. For you rule over all things. You rule over creation, you rule over time, you rule over life and death. You rule over the infinitesimal. You rule over the gigantic, the huge, but then you rule over the small, the microscopic, the invisible. Lord, you are glorious, you are majestic, you are perfect, you are holy. Lord, you are unfathomable, you are pure, you are other, you are fearsome, you are eternal. You are our redeemer, you are our rescuer, you are our saviour, you are our hope itself. You are king, you are God, and we bow our heads as we worship you. Lord, we love you, we run to you, we hide in you, bless us this day, we pray. Lord, would you unite us here at Walton as we gather, we meet in the name of Christ alone by faith alone, through grace alone, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everybody this morning, a particular welcome to everybody joining us online, whether we're meeting here in the building or online, it is great to gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a visitor, and maybe here for the first time, a particular welcome, I trust that you would have already had a warm greeting already. Do please stay behind after the formal part of our service is finished. It's great to get to know each other a little bit better over tea and coffee. Please do stay and join us. A, a special welcome to our long-standing good friend, Paul, Paul White, who has descended the hills of Darleydale to be with us this morning. Great to have you with us, Paul, and we are so grateful for you opening the scriptures for us this morning. And I'll just ask for you to pass on the love of all of us here to the 
brethren at Steep Turnpike in Matlock as well. Please do join us if you're able to for our evening service tonight at six o'clock. Another long-standing friend of Walton, Mark Foss, will be joining us from Cornerstone in Nottingham. And you will be blessed and you will be encouraged if you come and join us at six o'clock. Let's all be praying this week for our holiday club, which starts on Tuesday through Friday. How much would it be mean to each of us to see a boy or a girl come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it should mean the world to us. So we should be on our knees, friends, every day for Holy Club this week. We cannot save a single person, but God can. But there are things that we can do. And a notice has been given out for tonight in particular. So anybody able to stay behind after tonight's service, there are approximately 200 chairs need moving. And many hands make light work. So the more people that can help the better. Apparently there's more laminating than we know what to do with needs doing. So anybody who is particularly adept at laminating, please do join us as well. So after the service tonight, as many as possible, let's gather and bless one another as we help get ready for Holiday Club. Um, I may regret saying this, but at 10 to 7 in the morning, Tuesday to Friday, I will be here in the church building till 20 past 7 to pray. And if anybody wants to join me, you're more than welcome to. But it doesn't matter where we pray. But it matters that we pray. So whether we're in the building or wherever, let's be on our knees praying for the holiday club. Most of the clubs are not going to be functioning this week because of the holiday club. Just to remind us that there will not be a meeting on Wednesday night. I think there was initially advertised that there would be but there will not be on Wednesday night because the building is going to be used and laid out for Holiday Club. One final notice, not an insignificant one. Um, we had a birthday yesterday, didn't we, John? Where's John? I can't see John. There is John. We're not going to sing happy birthday to you, John, but we're going to applaud you. John is no longer 79 and is not quite 81. <laughs> so let's just have a quick round of applause to John. <laughs> well, let's sing our next song. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I trust that is true for us this morning. All our longings, all our dreams, our confidence should be based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. One recent speaker made this observation, profound, but so very simple and true. And that is that everything outside of Jesus Christ will perish. Everything outside of Jesus Christ will perish. It will not last. It will be destroyed and therefore we must friends put our trust in Jesus Christ in his work in his kingdom which will last forever do not trust in that which will not satisfy or will not last hope in Christ alone on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand and after this Mary will lead us in prayer
us come to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, holy and righteous, the same yesterday, today and forever, we bring our praise and our worship to you. We praise you as our creator, saviour and king, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of a re relationship with you and with each other in the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for all your many blessings. We rejoice in your love, in your grace and mercy. We rejoice in your goodness and your faithfulness to all your promises. Father, we thank you that in your love, you sent Jesus Christ, your son, to take the punishment for our sins by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Thank you for all that he suffered in our place to provide our forgiveness. In him we have been made righteous. Through him we have eternal life. Thank you that through Christ we have been reconciled to you. We are your children and citizens of your kingdom. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the Holy Scriptures, through which we can get to know you and your ways. Help us to listen to your word and put it into practice in our lives. Thank you for the gift of your indwelling Holy Spirit to empower us to live for you and guide and lead us into all truth. May we walk in step with your spirit day by day. Heavenly Father, we're sorry for the times that we don't live in obedience to you, when we fail to trust you and choose our own way rather than yours. Please forgive us for our willfulness, selfishness and pride. Help us to confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we pray for your blessing upon all who attend this church. Help each one of us to play our part as you lead us. We pray for those in our fellowship who are finding life difficult at the moment, facing the challenges in the workplace, in parenting and caring for loved ones. We pray for those who are housebound, sick or infirm, <coughs> and those who are grieving. We ask you, Lord, that you will encourage all those struggling at this time. Please bring healing, comfort, and peace, and strengthen them in their faith. Help each one of us to daily cast our cares upon you because you care so much for us. Lord, we pray for the Holiday Club taking place this week. Thank you for the opportunity to share the gospel with the children. We pray that your spirit will touch each child, help them to enjoy themselves, to understand the gospel message. May seeds be sown in hearts and minds so that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, help each child to share with their family what they have learned. We ask you, Lord, to please guide and encourage Tiago and all those involved in assisting and leading the club. Help them to communicate the gospel effectively. We pray for each helper to be a good witness and to enjoy being with the children. Heavenly Father, we pray for many Christians throughout the world who are persecuted for their faith. Please protect and encourage them. Strengthen them in their witness. We pray for the various ministries who are supporting the persecuted church, such as Open Doors and Barnabas Aid, and many others, that you would uphold them in their work. 
We pray for the protection of Jewish people around the world who are fearful as they face increased anti-Semitism. Please help them to turn to you. We pray for peace in the Middle East, for the people of Israel who are facing war on several fronts, from enemies that do not accept her right to exist as a nation. We particularly pray for the release of the remaining hostages in Gaza and that you will comfort their families. Please help the people of Israel to turn to you during these difficult times and draw them to Christ. Lord, we would pray for the people of Gaza to be liberated from the oppressive rule of Hamas and the indoctrination of extreme Islamic ideology. We pray for Gaza to have a new government that focuses, focuses upon the welfare of the Palestinian people rather than the destruction of Israel. We pray for the growth of the church in Gaza for many more to be saved. Father, we pray for peace in the Ukraine and Russia for all who are suffering as a result of the war. Thank you for the many national days of prayer that have been held in Ukraine despite the war, for the unity between the various denominations and the growth of the church. May this continue as your spirit moves powerfully. Loving Father, in all areas of war and conflict, we recognize the problem is not just political but spiritual. We pray that Satan's plans will be thwarted for the triumph of good over evil, for many people to be saved and to find peace and comfort in you. We pray for our new government in the UK to be guided by you in their decision making, that MPs will behave with honesty and integrity. We pray for Christians in Parliament to be strong and bold witnesses for you and able to influence decisions based on biblical values. Father, we pray for the working members of the royal family as they carry out their duties, that they will have good health. We particularly pray for the King and the Princess of Wales to recover from cancer. And we pray this for the salvation of the whole of the royal family. Father, as we continue in our worship today, we pray for Paul as he brings your word. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you are saying to us through him. May each one of us have a fresh revelation of your love and experience the joy of our salvation. For we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Well, before Julie gives us a scripture reading, we're going to sing our next song, which is Through All Life's Sorrows and Despair. As Mary was praying, there are many of us who are sick, many of us who are feeling our age, and many who are looking at death itself. We all face death. And our song says, I will not be moved I will not be moved when facing death. I need not fear. Another song describes it as our final war with pain. But if our hope is in Jesus Christ, we can triumph in his victory. Because we're singing about the death of death itself through the death of Christ. And the chorus that we're going to sing says, Where, O grave, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Those words from 1 Corinthians, eternity is won for me by heaven's eternal king. So let's stand if we're able and sing through all life's sorrows and despairs. Thank you. 
from God's Word is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. So in the Church Bibles, that's page 1049. Luke chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. <coughs> Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost 
and is found. Amen. Thank you, Julie. In a moment, we're going to sing our kids' song, and after that, Paul will come and preach to us from those verses and those of primary school age. Children will leave after this song to go to Sunday school. Before we sing, however, I'm just going to pray for us as we have the scriptures preached to us and for the boys and girls as they go to Sunday school. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active. Father, we thank you that it is precious, that it is treasure for our souls. Father, we pray as we are listening to your word, whether we are old or young, Father, would you teach us today? Help us through your spirit to understand what is being said. And would you please transform us to be more and more like your son? Thank you for Paul. Thank you for Tim and Caroline as they teach us this day. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, our children's song says, my father said, do not forget my teaching. And the chorus, we've sung this a few times, but quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So let's stand, if we're able, and sing this together. Don't let 
Well, thank you for your welcome. Always a, a real pleasure to be back at Walton to see uh, many old friends. We were in fellowship with uh, you for a number of years. And also new friends, because there are always new faces uh, that I've uh, got to know a little better as I've visited in more recent years. And of course, not a few members of family as well, which always complicates things slightly. And if you saw me in a a warm embrace with a, a woman who wasn't my wife just before the service, then that was my uh, beloved uh, cousin Liz Craig and, and of course uh, Mary and John Bird's aunt and uncle. And I, of course I ought to mention, just so he's not, he doesn't feel left out, that on the other side of the family, this is my wife's side of the family, is, would be little John Hill. I don't know why we call him little John, uh, because he's, he's hardly a, a weed, is he? But uh, I think it's just to distinguished John from uh, my big, big brother-in-law, John Hill. So uh, John's disappeared, but John, if you're feeling left out, I'll give you a hug after the service. Uh, but good to be with you. And greetings from the uh, church at Matlock to you as well, and we uh, are so grateful for your fellowship. If you do have a, a Bible, then please do open your Bible to that passage that was read to us from Luke chapter 15. Uh, it's a, a very familiar passage. I, I just want us to spend a, a short time this morning in this passage. It's probably one of the best-known uh, passages of the Bible, isn't it? The story that Jesus told that's traditionally referred to as the prodigal son. Uh, the account is only found in Luke's Gospel here in chapter 15, the passage that was read to us just a few moments ago. And unlike a number of other things recorded in the Gospels, it's not found in any of the other Gospel accounts in either Matthew, Mark or John. And it's of course what's called one of the parables of Jesus. If you look up the meaning of the of parable in the Oxford Dictionary, it will say a parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a, a spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. And throughout the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, there, there are probably nearly 40 parables, probably 37 of these wonderfully descriptive, these illustrative stories told by Jesus. And there are, of course, no parables recorded in John's Gospel because John really writes with a, a different style to the other three Gospel writers. Now, now, as people, we, we love the parables, don't we? We, we love a story. Uh, we love uh, something that illustrates a spiritual truth. We love stories. We're somehow wired, aren't we, to respond to a good story. Uh, how are we to understand the parables? Well, generally speaking, here's a, a, just a principle for the parables. We're to understand that they were given by Jesus to fundamentally illustrate just a single truth that he wants us to know. So they're given to illustrate just one truth that Jesus wants us to know. But this morning, I want to probably break every rule of interpreting the parables by looking at this parable of the prodigal son in, in some detail this morning. Why do I do that? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, because the parable of the prodigal is probably the best known of the parables of Jesus. Secondly, it's probably the longest of the parables. It's recorded with a significant amount of, of detail. And then thirdly, it deals with what I would suggest this morning is the most important subject found in the teaching of Jesus and in the Bible. How does a person get right with God? How does a person get right with God? How do sinful people like me and you come to know the God of heaven as our Father? So if we're a bit unsure about how to understand the parable of the prodigal or the lost son, it might say in your Bible, then we need to determine really the context, first of all, of the parable, where this story fits in to the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the context there in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 15, where we read these words, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners 
and eat with them. It's a recurring theme throughout the ministry of Jesus recorded for us in Luke's Gospel. The fact that Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was a friend of sinners. And for the religious elite of Jesus' day, this would have been scandalous, really, that Jesus showed mercy to broken and needy people like you and me, that he showed grace to people who were sinners. And it was something that displeased them greatly in all their self-righteousness. And, and you get a sense of that again even at the beginning of chapter 14. The religious leaders there, the, the Pharisees, they were watching Jesus closely, weren't they, to see how he dealt with sinners, with the lowest of the low. And, and so it's really on the back of that that the Lord Jesus tells us a series of consecutive parables here in Luke 15. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of of the lost son. And all are given to show that God, that Jesus has great compassion for lost people. So what I want us to do this morning is to just focus our attention for a few moments really on some of the detail of this parable and see how it really illustrates three truths. These are the three things that we're going to consider together. See the son's problem. See the son's problem. See the way back. See the Father's grace. Really simple. See the Son's problem. See the way back. See the Father's grace. So first of all, see the Son's problem. We see this in verse 11 to 16. Let's just go to the passage. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So first of all, under this title of See the Son's Problem, see the son's selfishness and rebellion. See the son's selfishness and rebellion. It, it, it's a very powerful picture, isn't it, that the Lord Jesus paints here for us. Jesus begins to, to tell this story about a man who had two sons. This man was probably a relatively wealthy man by Middle Eastern standards. Almost certainly a man, we could guess from the later verses of the passage, who had made his fortune from, from business. Maybe a farmer, maybe a landowner who had quite a number of servants working for him. But uh, apparently, as this man's two sons came to adulthood, the younger of the two began to get decidedly itchy feet about the constraints of living under his father's roof. Maybe his father was a religious man. Maybe he was a godly man. Maybe this younger son resented the, the moral expectations, the constraints that his father had on him. And he wanted to live his life in the way that he chose and go his own way and do his own thing and see how much greener the grass might be on the other side of the fence and let his hair down a little. And he's not keen on waiting till his dad breathes his last before he can get his hands on the inheritance. Now, I don't know whether you've ever thought about this, but this must have been incredibly hurtful to the father incredibly hurtful here his son not content not having enough respect to do the right thing and to wait for the right time so this selfish this arrogant and let's say this this rebellious son goes to the father and says i'm off give me the money now so i can do my own thing and go my own way it was willful selfish and wronged on the part of the son, and it must have broken the father's heart. 
But, you know, before we're too harsh on the sun, doesn't it remind us of one dimension of how we are? Just one dimension of how we are. It's just one as aspect of what the Bible calls sin. Uh, the thing that inhabits all our hearts. It's one characteristic of sin that we selfishly rebel, don't we, against our Father's care and against our Father's rule and against our Father himself and just stubbornly resist his way and insist on our own. That's me. It describes me. And if we're honest, it's all of us. Like the prodigal here, one characteristic of all of us is our selfishness and our rebellious spirit. But there's another thing described here vividly in this story that Jesus tells here about the son's problem, and it's this. In the story here, told by Jesus, we see that there is separation and distance between the father and the son. Now, it's an interesting story. It seems that in the son's haste to flee the authority of his father, the prodigal son is intent almost on putting as much space between himself and the father as possible. And that's described for us in verse 13, isn't it? Did you notice that? Not long after the, the, that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. In other words, the, the son isn't content just to be free of the father, but he actually goes out of his way to get as far from the father as possible to be free from his care and free from his influence and free from his sight. And it doesn't, he doesn't stay in the neighborhood, does he? In the same village or even in the same town or even in the same country. He deliberately, it seems to me, and consciously gets as far away from his father as he can. We're told in the passage there in verse 13 that he goes to a far off country probably a pagan nation that doesn't even have the same moral values that his father had. It wasn't even of the same religion as his father. It's illustrated by the fact that eventually he ends up feeding pigs, which would have been anathema, wouldn't it, to any self-respecting Jew. And again, let's be honest, doesn't this describe another dimension of what the Bible calls sin? Wandering from God. Our natural tendency as people is to walk away deliberately from God, to put as much distance between ourselves and God as possible. We reject his very existence, we deny his rule, we're ungrateful for his care, we dislike his presence. Have you noticed that in conversation in this modern culture in which we live and work in, that the unwillingness of people to speak about the realities of life is there a god what is life all about why were we placed in this world what's the purpose of life what is the end of our existence we have this natural tendency to resist all these great questions about life and the prodigal can't get away from his father fast enough he simply can't put enough distance between himself and his father and that's the condition of every person in the world it's sin puts immeasurable distance between us and god and always will there's something about human nature our natural state the bible says that makes this unbridgeable gulf between us and god as our maker because god is holy and we are not and we see here that the son's problem is one of selfishness and rebellion and separation and distance. But we also see here pictured something else about this state of lostness. See the prodigal in waste and want. It, it's, a, it's a tragic account as you read it, isn't it? As you read uh, the verses here that Jesus speaks of, just picture this sad saga for a moment. Uh, the son has deliberately wandered from the care and rule of his loving father. He's deliberately put distance between himself and his father. And it shouldn't be surprise, uh, a surprise to us that there are consequences to this way of living. There are consequences. Listen to the terrible 
outworking of this son's waywardness, there from verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. It's it's almost like the, the ultimate tale of cause and effect, isn't it? It's as though Jesus is giving this warning that if people choose to live their lives in this selfish way, in this rebellious way, that it should be no surprise that in life, life ends up a mess. That if we sow to the wind, we reap the whirlwind. That if we choose our own way over God's way, that we'll receive the wages of sin. And so the fortunes of this lost prodigal, they just go down and down. He's willfully wasted his father's wealth, hasn't he? He's lost his inheritance. He's chosen his own way. And now his life is in the gutter. He's penniless. He's homeless. And the only work that he can find is an almost unbelievable situation for a Jew to be in. He's feeding pigs. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Starving to death, wallowing in their filth to the extent that he's eating their food. Just a few weeks ago, we have a guy uh, in our congregation at Matlock, a retired minister who works as a a chaplain at Lincoln Prison. and He was giving away uh, a book that told the story of John Newton. It's a, a very interesting story, the man most famous for writing that hymn. Uh, amazing grace. John Newton had a very similar story to the prodigal here. He'd been brought up in a Christian home, in a religious home, but he rebelled against his family and against God. And from then on his life, when you read it, it was a downward spiral of evil and waste. He was court-martialed in the Royal Navy. And then as a slave trader, he eventually found himself as a slave, shackled to a tree starving in one of the slave stations of Africa. Until one day on his escape, returning on a ship, he was about to be shipwrecked and he began to think seriously about life and he was dramatically converted to faith in the Lord Jesus, a faith that radically altered the course of his life and led him to be one of the prime movers in the abolition of slavery in Great Britain. You see, sin brings the prodigal here to a place of waste and want. And I want to be really clear with us this morning, friends. I speak from sad experience, both in my own life and in the life of others. If we choose the way of the prodigal, we will end up in waste and want. We will end up in waste and want. Make no mistake, sin is real. Sin will ruin us, both in this life and in the next. Sin is the biggest killer in the world. It will kill us if we don't kill sin with the help of Jesus the Saviour and the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see here in the account of the prodigal. Sin is bad news for the prodigal. It's bad news for us. But there is good news as well. Because in this beautiful story told for us by Jesus, we see that there's the way back for lost prodigals. See the way back for lost prodigals there in verses 17 to 19. First of all, under this point, see the prodigal come to his senses. In this sad story, as you read through it, you could be tempted to think that there's no hope for the poor prodigal. He's just going to die of starvation in the pigsty, isn't he? End of story. Mercifully, the story goes on and remarkably there's hope. In a miraculous turn of events, we are told in verses 17 and 18 that the prodigal suddenly comes to his senses and says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. Now, when you read that in the passage, it seems just like a, a, a... on the surface, just to be a piece of patently obvious logic, doesn't it? The prodigal, now at his lowest, wallowing with the pig, suddenly has this thought, hold on a minute, hold on, why starve here when I can go back to my father, where even my father's servants are better off than me? But could I suggest that when Jesus speaks of the prodigal coming to his senses, 
that there's something more happening here, far more than just a bit of irresistible logic on the part of the lost son. And that this thought, this impression, was dropped into this prodigal's mind and soul because of the mercy and grace of God. And that's the case, I believe, with everyone who comes back to their father, comes in faith and repentance to the Lord Jesus. It's the testimony of so many here who are Christians this morning, isn't it? We're only ever Christians because God in his grace takes the initiative because he works in our lives by his Holy Spirit. He awakens us to our danger. He awakens us to the seriousness of our way of life, our sinful, willful rebellion against our God and our Maker. Just a few weeks ago, uh, a chap sat next to me in the church at Matlock and his name was John in his 60s. He came from a very non-religious background. Talked to me very openly about how for 60 years he'd lived a, a pretty successful, a pretty respectable life until one day he heard the gospel. He said to me, Paul, it was like, it was like someone switched a light on in my mind. <laughs> And in my soul, when I heard that good news for the first time, I thought, how have I missed this, this wonderful news of the gospel, this good news for 60 years? So God the Holy Spirit worked in his life to show him the beauty of the Lord Jesus. And God the Holy Spirit worked in his life to cause him to hear and understand the, the wonderful news that Jesus forgives sinners by his life and his death and his resurrection. And you see, sin blinds us to all this until that is God works in our lives to change us and give us new life. Friends, the Bible says we love because he first loved us. It says this is love not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God takes the initiative and that that humbles us. It should humble us. And even Charles Wesley believed that. In the hymn that we sing as we close this morning, this remarkable words, once my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. This is what the Bible means when it speaks about being born again. People awaken from their stupor, their, their stupidity, coming to their senses, realizing the danger that they're in because of their sin and rebellion before God. And so it's as though the prodigal here is born again. He's born again. He suddenly awakens to his condition. He comes alive. Uh, and that new life has amazing results. What does he do now? Well, first of all, he admits and he confesses his waywardness and his guilt. Did you see that remarkable confession there? See the prodigal's confession of guilt. Look, look there at verses 17 and 19. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. There's a total turnaround, isn't there? A total transformation in the prodigal's attitude. He's been brought low. He's humbled. None of the arrogance, none of the selfish pride that marked him at the beginning of the parable. No such thing. He faces up to his moral failure, to his guilt, to his sin. I've sinned against heaven, he says, and against you. And I'm going to say something, friends, this morning. That's the first mark of the Christian, of the true Christian. We own our own sin. We own it. God's grace helps us to face the music of our own moral failure. 
And it's one of the first signs that we've been given new life in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Confession of guilt. But there's something else pictured here as well in this wonderful parable of how the son returns. See the prodigal's repentance and faith. Look there at verse 18 to 20. The prodigal comes to his senses and, and said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of repentance and faith. Just picture this guy. He's there in the pigsty, his face in the pig trough. He suddenly comes to his senses. And he says, I'll set out and go back to my father. What does he do? He turns his back. He turns around. He puts his back where his face was, towards all that sin and failure and filth. And he puts his face where his back was. Repentance and faith. It's the message of the Bible. It's the most stunning picture. In order to come to Jesus, you see, in order... To be a Christian, we must repent of our sin. We must put our back where our face was and put our face where our back was and turn in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus. It's the uncompromising message of the Bible. It's the message of Christianity. What happens when we do that? Well, lastly, we've seen the son's problem we've seen the way back lastly see the father's grace and i want you to hear this this morning very clearly see the father's grace as the repentant prodigal returns we we read this wonderful description of mercy of grace as the father receives his son back firstly under this point see the readiness of the father to forgive see the readiness of the father to forgive, take up the reading there at verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants quick bring the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet you know when you read when you read those those stunning words you wonder don't you how many days how many weeks how many months how many years had the kind father just waited for his son to return well we don't know do we But we know this, the father was totally willing to receive his son when he came home. Surely that's clear, isn't it, from the passage, from what we're told here, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. There's not a a hint of unwillingness, is there, on behalf of the father to forgive. And that should be the greatest encouragement to us as sinful and fallen people the father is is abundantly ready to forgive and forget because of what christ did at the cross and by his death and resurrection i think it was charles spurgeon who famously commented on these verses he said god is more willing to receive sinners than sinners are to come to him God is more willing to receive sinners than sinners are to come to him. And then, as we finish this morning, see under this point the astounding generosity of the Father. Verse 22, But the Father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know, when you think about the grief 
and, and the disappointment of the father because of the waywardness of this prodigal son. These verses are stunning, aren't they? They're, they're absolutely stunning. Our natural inclinations as people, if, if we had suffered the same offence as the father here, our, our natural inclinations would be to perhaps accept the son back rather begrudgingly, to maybe receive him quietly and, and without fanfare, but what does the father do? Well, it's nothing short of astounding because the welcome is without restraint, isn't it? It's effusive, it's lavish. It, it's just gobsmackingly glorious and gracious, isn't it? Give him the best robe, sandals on his feet, give him one of my rings signifying acceptance, kill that prize bit of beef, prepare a feast, crack open that vintage wine, celebrate for this son of mine was alive, was dead and is alive, was lost, and is found. And it's a, it's a wonderful illustration of the generosity of God when lost people return to him. You see, when we become Christians, when we turn from our sin in, in repentance and we come to Jesus in faith, we don't just have our sins forgiven. It's a wonderful message that we have as Christians. It's, we have the goodness, the, the righteousness of, of Jesus put to our account, credited to us like the best robe to cover all our sin and shame. Uh, we're accepted into the family of God as his children, like a ring on our finger. God lavishes so many blessings on us that you could be forgiven for thinking that God is the prodigal God. One whose love and mercy and grace is extravagant, is, is lavish, is, is, is stupendous, is, is in a word amazing. And, it, and, and the gospel, the, the good news is, is almost so unbelievable, it's scandalous, it's so shocking that you could almost be offended and it's this amazing truth I think that offends so many in that it scandalizes people in the same way that it scandalizes the older brother here in this passage it's, it's such wonderful news that it almost seems unbelievable but it's true it's true and so the only question I want to ask us this morning as we finish is do you believe it do you believe it have you received it and has it been your experience I'm going to hand back to Dickie uh, as he leads us as we sing and close together thank you Dickie Thank you, Paul. What a challenge that is to us. I'd echo what Paul said there in terms of our response. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, then our hearts should sing at what Paul has shared with us this morning. If we're not believers in Jesus Christ, then flee, friend, to Jesus this morning. We're going to finish with a truly magnificent hymn. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. Every single verse of this hymn is full of heartwarming gospel truth. We sing about what God has done through his Son, how he has drawn us to himself, his plan of redemption, his mercy shown to sinners that even the angels, as Peter reminds us, long to look into and understand how God became incarnate became as a man and bled for each of us, how the chains of sin's captivity have been broken and as captives we're released, we have been born again, we are free with no condemnation ahead of us, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a gospel, what a salvation, what a saviour, what a wondrous story. Let's sting and be thrilled 
by divine grace. And can it be?
please be seated. Well, that brings us to the end of our formal part of the service. As I said at the beginning, please do stay behind. Let's encourage one another. And if you're thinking, what do I share with the person I don't know? Tell them how Jesus Christ opened your eyes. Share your testimony. Let's encourage one another. Let's bow our heads as we close. Tis mercy all immense, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me. Lord, we worship you in the splendour of holiness. We thank you for our time together this morning. And may the heavens be glad, may all the earth rejoice. And Lord, as we look to next week, Lord, would you bless the holiday club, we pray. May we declare in the streets of Chesterfield and among the nations that the Lord reigns. Lord, we give you thanks for you are good, your steadfast love endures forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.